military vehicle, a, a boat. It was terribly full of people, of equipment, the heavy kids. Everything had its place and everything had to be in its place. It had to be shit shaped in order to work at all. For anybody to get around and do anything. Anything that distracted them from their job, who hindered that hindered them from what they needed to be do, doing, had to be eliminated and, and taken care of. And there's a further level of preparedness that they would have. They called it clearing the decks. Clearing the decks for action, for a conflict, for a fight. And at that point, all things that are unnecessary for fighting that battle are put away. They're tied down. They're put in a locker, someplace where they can't get out and in the way. Because anything that would trip people as they carried the shot, as they carried the powder, as they did the many tasks that they had, would hinder the ship from fighting. So they would clear the decks and prepare the way for what they were doing. It's the strictest of all disciplines. And the punishment for not doing your job could be death. Because your failure could cause the death of an entire ship. I mean, that's even stricter than, than that coach for Rutgers is going to get over his problems. It's a difficult life, and we're faced with it. We need to be prepared in that way. Paul is going to talk about being ship shaped in his faith life as a Christian, as a believer in Christ, what discipline it requires. As we look at the 24th chapter of uh, Acts, Paul has been in prison for some time already. He was accused of causing riots in, in Jerusalem, and he was taken away by the Roman soldiers. And because he claimed his Roman citizenship, he was being sent to Rome to be judged in Caesar's courts. Not in Jewish courts, in Caesar's courts. And he is in Caesarea, and he has stopped there for a time, and he is coming up for his hearing before Felix, who was a Roman official there, and a person who had governed well and understood. And Paul is going before him to make his defense. And while we're not concerned so much for his defense uh, of his innocence at this particular time in this sermon, we need to hear what he has to say about the ordering of his life. And how he has made it ship shape for the Christian vessel of his life. Let me read to you from the second half of verse 14 down to 16. <coughs> Paul writes, I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have. Pointing to his accusers, the Pharisees from Jerusalem. He says, I have the same hope as they have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteousness and the wicked. And so I strive always to keep my conscience clear, there it is, clear before God and man. The first thing that Paul points out is that he has a clear understanding of what the scriptures say. And from that, he divines what it is that God wants of people, of his people, those that belong to him. So he says, I read the law and the prophets. That Old Testament, and it told me what it's all about. He believes in a loving and a good God that created this world. He made it with his own hands. He shaped it to his, his liking and his purpose. And, and, and according to his character, it is a good place and based upon him. And to Paul, this is basic in the understanding of what God wants. That he is the creator and the maker. This universe that we live in is not an accident. It is not a random happenstance. That is just, it is there because it's there. God made it according to his plan. And therefore, those of us who live in this world have to shape our lives according to that plan if we want it to work right. You see, that's the difference between living in a theistic creation and evolution. If we are just an accident, then who cares what we do? There's no right or wrong. It's just there. Whatever happens, happens. Paul says it's not so. We are created people in a created world, and we are made to live in a way that God designed us to live. In love, and kindness, and in cooperation, and strength, and the blessing of His Spirit that He wants to put upon us. This teaching is a direct challenge to human independence. If I can do it my own way. I told myself that 
that self-willed, <coughs> self-directed life that we humans love so much. And the funny thing is that the Jewish leadership in Paul's day had the form of godliness and the position of godliness as being uh, priests and leaders and teachers, but their heart was self-directed to their own desires and their own wants. And this teaching goes directly against the Romans of his day. The highest good a Roman person could have would be go out and choose to do something and do it no matter what it cost anybody. It's totally self-driven, self-actualization back in ancient times. And the harsher you can be to accomplish it, the better a person you are seen to be because you forced your will in this world. But as we read that law of prophets, God shows that he is a loving God who wants what is good for us. He wants to make a place for us. 